The Sworn Sword Part 2 Standfast was a castle only by courtesy. Though it stood bravely atop a rocky hill and could be seen for leagues around, it was no more than a tower house. A partial collapse a few centuries ago had required some rebuilding, so the north and west faces were pale gray stone above the windows and old black stone below. Turrets had been added to the roof line during the repair, but only on the sides that were rebuilt. At the other two corners crouched ancient stone grotesques, so badly abraded by wind and weather that it was hard to say what they had been. The pinewood roof was flat but badly warped and prone to leaks. A crooked path led from the foot of the hill up to the tower, so narrow it could only be ridden single file. Dunk led the way on the ascent, with Bennis just behind. He could see Egg above them, standing on a jut of rock in his floppy straw hat. They reined up in front of the little daub and wattle stable that nestled at the tower's foot, half hidden under a misshapen heap of purple moss. The old man's grey gelding was in one of the stalls next to Maester. Egg and Sam Stoops had gotten the wine inside, it seemed. Hens were wandering the yard. Egg trotted over. Did you find what happened to the stream? The Red Widow's dammed it up. Dunk dismounted and gave Thunder's reins to Egg. Don't let him drink too much at once. No, sir, I won't. Boy, Sir Bennis called. You can take my horse as well. Egg gave him an insolent look. I'm not your squire. That tongue of his will get him hurt one day, Dunk thought. You'll take his oar so you'll have a clout in the ear. Egg made a sullen face but did as he was bid. As he reached for the bridle, though, Sir Bennis hawked and spat. A glob of glistening red phlegm struck the boy between two toes. He gave the brown knight an icy look. You spit on my foot, sir. Bennis clambered to the ground. Aye, next time I'll spit in your face. I'll have none of your bloody tongue. Dunk could see the anger in the boy's eyes. Tend to the horses, Egg, he said before things got any worse. We need to speak with Sir Eustace. The only entrance into Standfast was through an oak and iron door twenty feet above them. The bottom steps were blocks of smooth black stone, so worn they were bowl-shaped in the middle. Higher up, they gave way to a steep wooden stair that could be swung up like a drawbridge in times of trouble. Dunk shooed the hens aside and climbed two steps at a time. Standfast was bigger than it appeared. Its deep vaults and cellars occupied a good part of the hill on which it perched. Above ground, the tower boasted four stories. The upper two had windows and balconies, the lower two only arrow slits. It was cooler inside, but so dim that Dunk had to let his eyes adjust. Sam Stoop's wife was on her knees by the hearth, sweeping out the ashes. "'Is Sir Eustace above or below?' Dunk asked her. "'Up, sir.' The old woman was so hunched that her head was lower than her shoulders. "'He just come back from visiting the boys, down in the Blackberries.' The boys were Eustace Osgray's sons, Edwin, Harold, Adam. Edwin and Harold had been knights, Adam a young squire. They had died on the red grass field fifteen years ago, at the end of the Blackfire Rebellion. They died good deaths, fighting bravely for the king, Sir Eustace told Dunk and I brought them home and buried them among the blackberries. His wife was buried there as well. Whenever the old man breached a new cask of wine, he went down to the hill to pour each of his boys a libation. To the king! he would call out loudly, just before he drank. Sir Eustace's bedchamber occupied the fourth floor of the tower, with his solar just below. That was where he would be found, Dunk knew. 
puttering amongst the chests and barrels. The solar's thick gray walls were hung with rusted weaponry and captured banners, prizes from battles fought long centuries ago and now remembered by no one but Sir Eustace. Half the banners were mildewed, and all were badly faded and covered with dust, their once bright colors gone to gray and green. Sir Eustace was scrubbing the dirt off a ruined shield with a rag when Dunk came up the steps. Bennis followed fragrant at his heels. The old knight's eyes seemed to brighten a little at the sight of Dunk. "'My good giant,' he declared, "'and brave Sir Bennis. Come, have a look at this. I found it in the bottom of that chest. A treasure, though fearfully neglected.' It was a shield, or what remained of one. That was little enough. Almost half of it had been hacked away, and the rest was gray and splintered. The iron rim was solid rust, and the wood was full of wormholes. A few flakes of paint still clung to it, but too few to suggest a sigil. "'My lord,' said Dunk. The Osgrays had not been lords for centuries, yet it pleased Sir Eustace to be styled so, echoing as it did the past glories of his house. "'What is it?' "'The little lion shield.' The old man rubbed at the rim, and some flakes of rust came off. "'Sir Wilbert Osgray bore this at the battle where he died. I am sure you know the tale.' "'No, my lord,' said Bennis. "'We don't, as it happens. The little lion, did you say? What, was he a dwarf or some such?' "'Certainly not!' the old knight's moustache quivered. "'Sir Wilbert was a tall and powerful man, and a great knight. "'The name was given him in childhood, as the youngest of five brothers. "'In his day there were still seven kings in the seven kingdoms, "'and High Garden and the Rock were oft at war. "'The green kings ruled us then, the gardeners.' They were of the blood of old Garth Greenhand, and a green hand upon a white field was their kingly banner. Giles the Third took his banners east to war against the Storm King, and Wilbert's brothers all went with him. For in those days the Checky Lion always flew beside the green hand when the King of the Reach went forth to battle. Yet it happened that while King Giles was away, the King of the Rock saw his chance to tear a bite out of the reach. So he gathered up a host of Westermen and came down upon us. The Osgreys were the marshals of the North March, so it fell to the little lion to meet them. It was the fourth King Lancel who led the Lannisters, it seems to me, or mayhaps the fifth. Sir Wilbert blocked King Lancel's path and bid him halt. Come no farther, he said. You are not wanted here. I forbid you to set foot upon the reach. But the Lannister ordered all his banners forward. They fought for half a day, the gold lion and the checky. The Lannister was armed with a Valyrian sword that no common steel can match, so the little lion was hard-pressed, his shield in ruins. In the end, bleeding from a dozen grievous wounds, with his own blade broken in his hand, he threw himself headlong at his foe. King Lancel cut him near in half, the singers say, but as he died, the little lion found the gap in the king's armor beneath his arm and plunged his dagger home. When their king died, the westermen turned back, and the reach was saved. The old man stroked the broken shield as tenderly as if it had been a child. Aye, my lord, Bennis croaked. We could use a man like that today. Dunk and me had a look at your stream, my lord. Dry as a bone, 
and not from no drought. The old man set the shield aside. Tell me. He took a seat and indicated that they should do the same. As the brown knight launched into the tale, he sat listening intently, with his chin up and his shoulders back, as upright as a lance. In his youth, Sir Eustace Osgray must have been the very picture of chivalry, tall and broad and handsome. Time and grief had worked their will on him, but he was still unbent, a big-boned, broad-shouldered, barrel-chested man with features as sharp and strong as some old eagle. His close-cropped hair had gone white as milk, but the thick mustache that hid his mouth remained an ashy gray. His eyebrows were the same color, the eyes beneath a paler shade of gray and full of sadness. They seemed to grow sadder still when Bennis touched upon the dam. That stream has been known as the Checky Water for a thousand years or more, the old knight said. I caught fish there as a boy, and my sons all did the same. Alisan liked to splash in the shallows on hot summer days like this. Alisan had been his daughter, who had perished in the spring. It was on the banks of the checky water that I kissed a girl for the first time. A cousin she was, my uncle's youngest daughter, of the Osgreys of Leafy Lake. They are all gone now, even her. His mustache quivered. This cannot be borne, sirs. The woman will not have my water. She will not have my checky water. Dam's built strong, my lord, Sir Bannis warned. Too strong for me and Sir Dunk to pull down in an hour, even with the bold dead boy to help. We'll need ropes and picks and axes and a dozen men. And that's just for the work, nor for the fighting. Sir Eustace stared at the little lion's shield. Dunn cleared his throat. My lord, as to that, when we came upon the diggers, well... Dunk, don't trouble my lord with trifles, said Bennis. I taught one fool a lesson, that was all. Sir Eustace looked up sharply. What sort of lesson? Uh, with my sword, as it were. A little claret on his cheek, that's all it were, my lord. The old knight looked long at him. That... that was ill-considered, sir. The woman has a spider's heart. She murdered three of her husbands, and all her brothers died in swaddling clothes. Five there were, or six, mayhaps, I don't recall. They stood between her and the castle. She would whip the skin off any peasant who displeased her, I do not doubt. But for you to cut one? No, she will not suffer such an insult. Make no mistake. She will come for you as she came for Lem. Dyke, my lord, Sir Bannis said. Begging your lordly pardon, you knew him and I never did, but his name were Dake. If it please, my lord, I could go to Golden Grove and tell Lord Rowan of this dam, said Dunk. Rowan was the old knight's liege lord. The Red Widow held her lands of him as well. Rowan? No, look for no help there. Lord Rowan's sister wed Lord Wyman's cousin Wendell, so he is kin to the Red Widow. Besides, he loves me not. Sir Duncan, on the morrow you must make the rounds of all my villages and roust out every able-bodied man of fighting age. I am old, but I am not dead. The woman will soon find that the checky lion still has claws. Two, Dunk thought glumly. And I am one of them. 
Sir Eustace's land supported three small villages, none more than a handful of hovels, sheepfolds, and pigs. The largest boasted a thatched one-room sept with crude pictures of the seven scratched upon the walls in charcoal. Mudge, a stoop-backed old swine herd who'd once been to Old Town, led devotions there every seventh day. Twice a year, a real septon came through to forgive sins in the mother's name. The small folk were glad of the forgiveness, but hated the septon's visits all the same since they were required to feed him. They seemed no more pleased by the sight of Dunk and Egg. Dunk was known in the villages, if only as Sir Eustace's new knight, but not so much as a cup of water was offered him. Most of the men were in the fields, so it was largely women and children who crept out of the hovels at their coming, along with a few grandfathers too infirm for work. Egg bore the Osgrey banner, the checky lion green and gold, rampant upon its field of white. "'We come from Stanfast with Sir Eustace's summons,' Dunk told the villagers." Every able-bodied man between the ages of fifteen and fifty is commanded to assemble at the tower on the morrow. Is it war? asked one thin woman, with two children hiding behind her skirts and a babe sucking at her breast. Is the black dragon come again? There are no dragons in this, black or red, Dunk told her. This is between the checky lion and the spiders. The Red Widow has taken your water. The woman nodded, though she looked askance when Egg took off his hat to fan his face. That boy got no air. He's sick. It's shaven, said Egg. He put the hat back on, turned Maester's head, and rode off slowly. The boy is in a prickly mood today. He had hardly said a word since they set out. Dunk gave Thunder a touch of the spur and soon caught the mule. "'Are you angry that I did not take your part against Sir Benis yesterday?' he asked his sullen squire as they made for the next village. "'I like the man no more than you, but he is a knight. You should speak to him with courtesy.' "'I'm your squire, not his,' the boy said." He's dirty and mean-mouthed, and he pinches me. If he had an inkling of who you were, he'd piss himself before he laid a finger on you. He used to pinch me, too. Dunk had forgotten that till Egg's words brought it back. Sir Benis and Sir Arlen had been amongst a party of knights hired by a Dornish merchant to see him safe from Lannisport to the Prince's Pass. Dunk had been no older than Egg though taller. He would pinch me under the arm so hard he'd leave a bruise. His fingers felt like iron pincers, but I never told Sir Arlen. One of the other knights had vanished near Stony Sept, and it was brooded about that Benis had gutted him in a quarrel. If he pinches you again, tell me and I'll end it. Till then, it does not cost you much to tend his horse. Someone has to, Egg agreed. Benis never brushes him. He never cleans his stall. He hasn't even named him. Some knights never name their horses, Dunk told him. That way, when they die in battle, the grief's not so hard to bear. There are always more horses to be had, but it's hard to lose a faithful friend. Or so the old man said but he never took his own counsel. He named every horse he ever owned. So had Dunk. We'll see how many men turn up at the tower, but whether it's five or fifty, you'll need to do for them as well. Egg looked indignant. I have to serve small folk? Not serve. Help. We need to turn them into fighters. If the widow gives us time enough... If the gods are good, a few will have done some soldiering before, but most will be green as summer grass, more used to holding hoes than spears. Even so, a day may come when our lives depend on them. How old were you when you first took up a sword? 
I was little, sir. The sword was made from wood. Common boys fight with wooden swords, too. Only theirs is sticks and broken branches. Egg, these men may seem fools to you. They won't know the proper names for bits of armor, or the arms of the great houses, or which king it was who abolished the Lord's right to the first knight. But treat them with respect all the same. You were a squire born of noble blood, but you are still a boy. Most of them will be men grown. A man has his pride, no matter how low-born he may be. You would seem just as lost and stupid in their village. And if you doubt that, go hoe a row and shear a sheep, and tell me the names of all the weeds and wildflowers in Watts Wood. The boy considered for a moment. I could teach them the arms of the great houses, and how Queen Alisan convinced King Jaehaerys to abolish the first night, and they could teach me which weeds are best for making poisons, and whether those green berries are safe to eat. They could, Dunk agreed. But before you get to King Jaehaerys, you'd best help us teach them how to use a spear. And don't go eating anything that Maester won't. The next day, a dozen would-be warriors found their way to Standfast to assemble among the chickens. One was too old, two were too young, and one skinny boy turned out to be a skinny girl. Those Dunk sent back to their villages, leaving eight. Three Watts, two Wills, a Lem, a Pate, and Big Rob the Lackwit. A sorry lot, he could not help but think. The strapping, handsome peasant boys who won the hearts of highborn maidens in the songs were nowhere to be seen. Each man was dirtier than the last. Lem was fifty if he was a day, and Pate had weepy eyes. They were the only two who had ever soldiered before. Both had gone with Sir Eustace and his sons to fight in the Blackfire Rebellion. The other six were as green as Dunk had feared. All eight had lice. Two of the Watts were brothers. "'Guess your mother didn't know no other name,' Bennis said, cackling. As far as arms went, they brought a scythe, three hoes, an old knife, some stout wooden clubs. Lem had a sharpened stick that might serve for a spear, and one of the wills allowed that he was good at chucking rocks. "'Well and good,' Bennis said. "'We got us a bloody trebuchet!' After that, the man was known as Treb. "'Are any of you skilled with a longbow?' Dunk asked them. The men scuffed at the dirt while hens pecked the ground around them. Pate of the weepy eyes finally answered, "'Begging your pardon, sir, but my lord don't permit us longbows. Those grey deers is for the checky lions, not the likes of us.' "'Will we get swords and helms and chain mail?' "'The youngest of the three Watts wanted to know. "'Why, sure you will,' said Bennis. "'Just as soon as you kill one of the widow's knights "'and strip his bloody corpse. "'Make sure you stick your arm up his horse's ass, too. "'That's where you'll find his silver.' "'He pinched young Watt beneath his arm "'until the lad squealed in pain.' then marched the whole lot of them off to Watts Wood to cut some spears. When they came back, they had eight fire-hardened spears of wildly unequal length and crude shields of woven branches. Sir Bennis had made himself a spear as well, and he showed them how to thrust with the point and use the shaft to parry, and where to put the point to kill. "'The belly and the throat are best, I find.' He pounded his fist against his chest. Right there's the heart. That'll do the job as well. Trouble is, the ribs is in the way. The belly's nice and soft. Gotten slow, but certain. Never knew a man to live when his guts was hanging out. Now if some fool goes and turns his back on you, put your point between his shoulder blades or through his kidney. That's it. They don't live long once you prick them in the kidney. 
Having three Watts in the company caused confusion when Bennis was trying to tell them what to do. We should give them village names, sir, Egg suggested. Like Sir Arlen of Pennytree, your old master. That might have worked, only their villages had no names either. Well, said Egg, we could call them for their crops, sir. One village sat amongst bean fields, one planted mostly barley corn, and the third cultivated rows of cabbages, carrots, onions, turnips, and melons. No one wanted to be a cabbage or a turnip, so the last lot became the melons. They ended up with four barley corns, two melons, and two beans. As the brothers Watt were both barley corns, some further distinction was required. When the younger brother made mention of once having fallen down the village well, Bennis dubbed him Wet Watt, and that was that. The men were thrilled to have been given Lord's names, save for Big Rob, who could not seem to remember whether he was a bean or a barley corn. Once all of them had names and spears, Sir Eustace emerged from Standfast to address them. The old knight stood outside the tower door, wearing his mail and plate beneath a long woolen surcoat that age had turned more yellow than white. On front and back it bore the checky lion, sewn in little squares of green and gold. "'Lads,' he said, "'you all remember Dake. The Red Widow threw him in a sack and drowned him. She took his life, and now she thinks to take our water too.' The checky water that nourishes our crops. But she will not. He raised his sword above his head. For Osgray, he said ringingly. For stand fast. Osgray, Dunk echoed. Egg and the recruits took up the shout. Osgray, Osgray, for stand fast. Dunk and Bennis drilled the little company amongst the pigs and chickens, while Sir Eustace watched from the balcony above. Sam Stoops had stuffed some old sacks with soiled straw. Those became their foes. The recruits began practicing their spear work as Bennis bellowed at them. Stick and twist and rip it free. Stick and twist and rip, but get the damn thing out. You'll be wanting it soon enough for the next one. Too slow, Treb, too damn slow. If you can't do it quicker, go back to chucking rocks. Lem, get your weight beyond your thrust, there's a boy. And in and out, and in and out. Fuck em with it, that's the way, in and out. Rip em, rip em, rip em. When the sacks had been torn to pieces by half a thousand spear for thrusts and all the straw spilled out onto the ground, Dunk donned his mail and plate and took up a wooden sword to see how the men would fare against a livelier foe. Not too well, was the answer. Only Treb was quick enough to get a spear past Dunk's shield, and he only did it once. Dunk turned one clumsy lurching thrust after another, pushed their spears aside, and bowled in close. If his sword had been steel instead of pine, he would have slain each of them half a dozen times. You're dead once I get past your point, he warned them, hammering at their legs and arms to drive the lesson home. Treb and Lem and Wet Watt soon learned how to give ground, at least. Big Rob dropped his spear and ran, and Bennis had to chase him down and drag him back in tears. The end of the afternoon saw the lot of them all bruised and battered, with fresh blisters rising on their calloused hands from where they gripped their spears. Dunk bore no marks himself, but he was half drowned in sweat by the time Egg helped him peel his armor off. As the sun was going down, Dunk marched their little company down into the cellar and forced them all to have a bath, even those who'd had one just last winter. Afterward, Sam Stroop's wife had bowls of stew for all, thick with carrots, onions, and barley. The men were bone-tired, but to hear them talk, every one of them would soon be twice as deadly as a Kingsguard knight. They could hardly wait to prove their valor. 
Sir Bena sagged them on by telling them of the joys of the soldier's life. Lewd and women, chiefly. The two old hands agreed with him. Lem had brought back a knife and a pair of fine boots from the Blackfire Rebellion, to hear him tell it. The boots were too small for him to wear, but he had them hanging on his wall. And Pate could not say enough about some of the camp followers he'd known following the dragon. Sam Stoops had set them up with eight straw pallets in the undercroft. So once their bellies were filled, they all went off to sleep. Bennis lingered long enough to give Dunk a look of disgust. So useless should have fucked a few more peasant wenches while he still had a bit of sap left in them old sad balls of his, he said. If he'd sowed himself a nice crop of bastards back then, might be we'd have some soldiers now. They seem no worse than any other peasant levy. Dunk had marched with a few such while squiring for Sir Arlen. Aye, Sir Bennis said. In a fortnight they might stand their own, against some other lot of peasants. Knights, though? He shook his head and spat. Standfast's well was in the undercellar, in a dank chamber walled in stone and earth. It was there that Sam Stroop's wife soaked and scrubbed and beat the clothes before carrying them up to the roof to dry. The big stone wash tub was also used for baths. Bathing required drawing water from the well bucket by bucket, heating it over the hearth in a big iron kettle, emptying the kettle into the tub, then starting the whole process once again. It took four buckets to fill the kettle, and three kettles to fill the tub. By the time the last kettle was hot, the water from the first had cooled to lukewarm. Sir Bennis had been heard to say that the whole thing was too much bloody bother, which was why he crawled with lice and fleas and smelled like a bad cheese. Dunk at least had Egg to help him when he felt in dire need of a good wash, as he did tonight. The lad th drew the water in a glum silence and hardly spoke as it was heating. Egg? Dunk asked as the last kettle was coming to a boil. Is all a miss? When Egg made no reply, he said, Help me with the kettle. Together they wrestled it from hearth to tub, taking care not to splash themselves. Sir, the boy said, What do you think Sir Eustace means to do? Tear down the dam and fight off the widow's men if they try to stop us. He spoke loudly, so as to be heard above the splashing of the bath water. Steam rose in a white curtain as they poured, bringing a flush to his face. Their shields are woven wood, sir. A lance could punch right through them, or a crossbow bolt. We may find some bits of armor for them, when they're ready. That was the best they could hope for. They might be killed, sir. Wet wad is still half a boy. Will Barleycorn is to be married the next time the Septon comes. And Big Rob doesn't even know his left foot from his right. Dunk let the empty kettle thump down onto the hard-packed earthen floor. Roger of Pennytree was younger than Wet Wat when he died on the red grass field. There were men in your father's house who'd just been married too, and other men who'd never even kissed a girl. There were hundreds who didn't know their left foot from their right. Maybe thousands. That was different, Egg insisted. That was war. So is this. The same thing, only smaller. Smaller and stupider, sir. That's not for you or me to say, Dunk told him. It's their duty to go to war when Sir Eustace summons them. And to die, if need be. Then we shouldn't have named them, sir. It will only make the grief harder for us when they die. He screwed up his face. If we used my boot... No. Dunk stood on one leg to pull his own boot off. Yes, but my father... No. The second boot went the way of the first. We... No. Dunk pulled his sweat-stained tunic up over his head and tossed it at Egg. Ask Sam Stroop's wife to wash that for me. 
I will, sir, but no, I said. Do you need a clout in the ear to help you hear better? He unlaced his breeches. Underneath was only him. It was too hot for small clothes. It's good that you're concerned for what and what and what and the rest of them. But the boot is only meant for dire need. How many eyes does Lord Bloodraven have? A thousand eyes and one. What did your father tell you when he sent you off to squire for me? To keep my hair shaved or dyed and tell no man my true name, the boy said with obvious reluctance. Egg had served Dunk for a good year and a half, though some days it seemed like twenty. They had climbed the Prince's Pass together and crossed the deep sands of Dorne, both red and white. A pole boat had taken them down to the Planky Town, where they took passage for Old Town on the galleous White Lady. They had slept in stables, inns, and ditches, broken bread with holy brothers, whores, and mummers, and chased down a hundred puppet shows. Egg had kept Dunk's horse, horse groomed, his long sword sharp, his mail free of rust. He had been as good a companion as any man could wish for, and the hedge knight had come to think of him almost as a little brother. He isn't, though. This egg had been hatched of dragons, not of chickens. Egg might be a hedge knight squire, but Aegon of House Targaryen was the fourth and youngest son of Makar, Prince of Summerhall, himself the fourth son of the late King Daron the Good, the second of his name, who'd sat the Iron Throne for five and twenty years until the Great Spring Sickness took him off. So far as most folk are concerned, Aegon Targaryen went back to Summerhall with his brother Daron after the tourney at Ashford Meadow. Dunk reminded the boy. Your father did not want it known that you were wandering the Seven Kingdoms with some edge knight. So let's hear no more about your boot. A look was all the answer that he got. Egg had big eyes, and somehow his shaven head made them look even larger. In the dimness of the lamplit cellar, they looked black. But in better light, their true color could be seen. Deep and dark and purple. Valyrian eyes, thought Dunk. In Westeros, few but the blood of the dragon had eyes that color or hair that shone like beaten gold and strands of silver woven all together. When they'd been pulling down the green blood, the orphan girls had made a game of rubbing Egg's shaven head for luck. It made the boy blush redder than a pomegranate. Girls are so stupid he would say. The next one who touches me is going into the river. Dunk had to tell him, Then I'll be touching you. I'll give you such a clout in the ear you'll be hearing bells for a moon's turn. That only goaded the boy to further insolence. Better bells than stupid girls, he insisted. But he never threw anyone into the river. Dunk stepped into the tub and eased himself down until the water covered him up to his chin. It was still scalding hot on top, though cooler further down. He clenched his teeth to keep from yelping. If he did, the boy would laugh. Egg liked his bath water scalding hot. Do you need more water boiled, sir? This will serve. Dunk rubbed at his arms and watched the dirt come off in long gray clouds. Fetch me the soap. Oh, and the long-handled scrub brush, too. Thinking about Egg's hair had made him remember that his own was filthy. He took a deep breath and slid underneath the water to give it a good soak. When he emerged again, sloshing, Egg was standing beside the tub with the soap and long-handled horsehair brush in hand. You have airs on your cheek, Dunk observed as he took the soap from him. Two of them. There. Below your ear. Make sure you get them the next time you shave your head. I will, sir. The boy seemed pleased by the discovery. No doubt he thinks a bit of beard makes him a man. Dunk had thought the same when he first found some fuzz growing on his upper lip. I tried to shave with my dagger and almost nicked my nose off. Go and get some sleep now, 
he told Ag. I won't have any more need of you till morning. It took a long while to scrub all the dirt and sweat away. Afterward, he put the soap aside, stretched out as much as he was able, and closed his eyes. The water had cooled by then. After the savage heat of the day, it was a welcome relief. He soaked till his feet and fingers were all wrinkled up and the water had gone gray and cold, and only then reluctantly climbed out. Though he and Egg had been given thick straw pallets down in the cellar, Dunk preferred to sleep up on the roof. The air was fresher there, and sometimes there was a breeze. It was not as though he need have much fear of rain. The next time it rained on them up there would be the first. Egg was asleep by the time Dunk reached the roof. He lay on his back with his hands behind his head and stared up at the sky. The stars were everywhere, thousands and thousands of them. It reminded him of a night at Ashford Meadow, before the tourney started. He had seen a falling star that night. Falling stars were supposed to bring you luck, so he'd told Tanzel to paint it on his shield. But Ashford had been anything but lucky for him. Before the tourney ended, he had almost lost a hand and a foot, and three good men had lost their lives. I gained a squire, though. Egg was with me when I rode away from Ashford. That was the only good thing to come of all that happened. He hoped that no stars fell tonight.